early Shabbat Shalom. On this Shabbat before Passover, we're really thrilled that you're choosing to tune in today. Um, we know that uh, this week, this upcoming weekend and week look different for everyone. Uh, but as you are thinking about and spiritually preparing for Passover, we're happy to be part of that process with you. Um, and we're really thrilled to, to learn some Torah. Um, I see people are in the chat writing where they're they're joining from. I invite you to continue doing that. We have people up early in Arizona. Um, we have someone uh, coming in from Saudi Arabia. It's always nice to, to see where people are joining from. Um, today, we are joined by Bex Stern Rosenblatt, um, who is the uh, educator in residence at the Fuchsburg Center, uh, which is based in Jerusalem, but she's the North American educator. Um, and I will soon turn it over to her. Um, I will place the source sheet in the chat as well. Um, and Bex, if you would like to share screen, you now have the ability to. If you'd like me to share, I'm happy to as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Mara. I, I'm going to ask you to share, but not quite yet. Um, hi, everyone. It is fantastic to be here with you. And it's especially fantastic to see some of you who I haven't seen, it feels like in months, and many of you who I haven't seen ever. So if I haven't ever seen you, nice to see you. And big welcome to Amy, who I haven't seen in months, who it's lovely to see you, and hi to Don and Deborah, who I'll see again in 45 minutes. Um, Tov, so let's get started. We are in one of those sort of nastily graphic, ah, shnia, before I get started, just some, some base rules of how this works. I am very much a person who likes to take advantage of the fact that I've got 150 plus brilliant people here to think with me. So I know what I wanna say. I know what I already think about this parasha, but I am very, very interested in what your all takes are on this parasha. So I'm going to talk at you for a bit, and then eventually I'm going to allow y'all to raise a hand if you've got something to say, and I will call on you and unmute you. If I do that and you are talking in front of all 157 people here, you best talk for two, three sentences and get out. We, we are not interested in your dissertation. If you have one, that's great. Email it to me. I'd love to read it. But don't share it with all of us because this is my show right now. So, so here we are in Parashat Mitzvah. It is one of these very graphic parshiot. It is a, uh, it's kind of fun because we are we are getting down and dirty and green and yellow and red. Uh, we're actually not going to be focusing on the bits of it that are happening to our body. We're not going to be focusing on skin disease. Rather, we're going to be focusing on whatever zagat is, this, this disease is. It's traditionally translated as leprosy. It is not, in fact, leprosy. It's some sort of disease. We're going to be focusing on what that is when it happens to your house. And we'll be focusing really just on one verse and on some of the midrashim on that verse about what it means that this is something that happens to your house. So without further ado, Mara, if you would, if you would share the source sheet um, and put it up in the chat, we're going to start reading. Thank you, Mara. So... We are in the middle of the parasha. We read the first chapter already, which is about skin disease, which is something can, that can happen to you anywhere. It can happen to us as we're wandering around the desert. It can happen to, to you know, me yesterday finding something weird on my elbow. Um, and now we move into the second half. We start again with V'yedaber Hashim El Moshe Ve'el Aaron Lemor. So we have another introduction. We say, and God spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, and what does God say? He says, Ki tavo'u el elet kanan. 
when you come to the land of Canaan, Asher Aminot, Ten lechem la which I am giving to you as a possession, as a holding. And I then I will give a, a plague, a, a touch of this disease in the house of your land of y'all's holding. Now, that's a very literal translation. It is chunky, it is kind of weird right? Like, what on earth am I talking about when I say a house of the land of y'all's holding? Like, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean anything yet, and we want to unpack it a little bit. So where we're going to start, actually, is with the idea of biblical parallelism. Um, Richard, we're going to get to Rashi. Um, anybody, anybody know what biblical parallelism is? Biblical parallelism? Nod your noses, stick up your hands. Is this something you're you're familiar with? Noah's got a got a no on his nose, and Marcy is saying yes. Okay, okay. So, and many of you are are declining to comment. Um, so biblical parallelism is this technique found in the Tanakh in the Bible where we find the same thing said twice in slightly different words. The second time we say it, it's pushing the meaning a little further. So a classic example is all the way back in Genesis four. This is, nobody knows this is sort of boring. It's Cain had a bunch of kids and his seventh descendant was named Limech and Limech like Cain was not, not the best guy. Limech says, uh, says, I have slain a lad for bruising me and a kid for hitting me. And so we're saying the same thing twice. A lad for bruising me, a kid for hitting me. Same, same idea, very similar words, same format, but we say it twice over. So now coming into our verse with that idea of biblical parallelism, using similar words to say, almost the same thing. Can someone find biblical parallelism in our verse where, where we have repeating words with slightly different concepts or with an expanded concept? Biblical parallelism, going once. Who's got it? Who's got it? Marcy, hello. Let me, let me, oh, I don't know if I, actually if I can unmute you. Um, all right, I don't think I can unmute you. Somebody, somebody. I just uh, uh, unmuted give me Marcy. The, give me the powers. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Marcy, go for it. First of all, it says, I will give a plague of disease upon the house and the land you possess. Something like a plague has come upon my house. So right away, it immediately has the plague has come upon my house. The plague has come upon my house. And it's going to go keep saying that all the way through the parasha. What happens when a plague comes upon my house? A plague has come upon my house. Awesome. Thank you, Marcy. So yes, and that's verses 34 and 35, right? So that's a word that repeats is this this plague, this this nega, um, that comes upon my house. Awesome, Marcy. Looking just within verse 34, I think someone said as well in the chat. Um, no, we didn't get it in the chat yet. I'm imagining things. Um, just within verse 34, are there repeating words, repeating concepts? A possession, the land you possess. So, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm giving you the land of Canaan, I was giving you as a possession, I'm giving you in the land you possess. Great. Thank you, Marcy. So yeah, we have this, 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 these repeating words. One is I give and I will give, right? The format starts with God giving. What is God giving? In the first half of the verse, God is giving, uh, God is giving us uh, uh, the land as a, as a possession. In the second half of the verse, God is giving us this plague of skin disease. What now that's weird, right? That's that's very odd. We say, okay, 
what what have I done that I deserve this plague of skin disease? How do I connect these two halves of the verses, two different halves of the verses? One, I come to the land. Two, I get skin disease, both of which are given by God. It's almost as if looking at this biblical parallelism by like just by coming to the land, I'm automatically going to get this disease in my house. Like I necessarily get diseased house by coming into the land and it's like no god like we've been wandering around in the desert for 40 years can i just like i would like to go somewhere with a nice house that's clean and not not worry about it you know collapsing a black mold what 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 is this about why is it necessary that when i come into the land my house will be diseased why is me coming why does me coming to the land necessitate my house being diseased tough so Let's back up for a sec and look at what it means when we're saying saying plague. Ooh, ooh, I like these comments though. Uh, Arnold says, is it a test? Carlo says, says, could it be vaccination? Interesting, interesting. Okay, okay, we got some possibilities. Uh, keep putting them in. Keep putting them in, and we'll get to the midrashim, which will support some of your answers, and we'll see where those midrashim are coming in. But before we get there, talk to me about the word naga, this word which gets translated as plague. I know some of you don't want to play the Hebrew game, but some of you want to play it with me. So people who are people who want to play Hebrew, what is what is the word naga? Where does it come from? Where else do we find it? Yeah, Andrew, touch your face. Okay. Legat, it's it's this touch word. Um, where else in the Tanakh do we find it? Where where who's ha, has God touched? <laughs> this sounds bad. Has God touched people before? Um, where is where is God's touch occurred before in the Tanakh? Where do we find this? Who knows? Who knows? Put it in the put it in the chat. Or or raise a hand and Mara will unmute you. Uh, anybody, anybody, God's touching people. Arnold. Um, okay, okay. Arnold should be able to unmute. Oh, Arnold. Yeah, I'm sorry, there. I apologize. Uh, I'm not sure this is it, but we're God hardens uh, Pharaoh's heart? Is that a touch of God that did that? Oh, you think really cool. It is not the same word. We get we don't get God touching Pharaoh's heart when he hardens Pharaoh's heart, but it's an interesting idea when we say, okay, when God is interacting with people, is this for good or for bad? And there God is interacting with like physical almost interaction with Pharaoh in a way that is bad. Uh, can, can Amy unmute? The tenth plague is called a nega. Awesome. <laughs> Amy, I'm glad to have you back. Um, oh, it's so great to see you back. <laughs> all right, Yefe. So the tenth plague is called a nega. The tenth plague, God says, this time I'm going to come nega the Egyptians and strike down all their firstborns. Uh, and it's, 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 like it's very much in your face connection here that the thing we just came from, like we we are doing, we're coming from from going out of Egypt, Yitziat Mitzrayim, we've just destroyed all those Egyptians. We've been wandering around for a bit. We've had Mount Sinai. And now God says, okay, when you come into the land, which like we would think of as the land of milk and honey, like the land where everything good is supposed to happen, the land we've been waiting to come for, like the place of our redemption, the place where you know we get to kick back and drink our drink our tea and uh, play sudoku, and instead God says, "Okay, when you come into the land, not only are your houses going to be diseased, but also they're going to be diseased by naga. They're going to be diseased by the same word which I used as a plague, as as a way to strike down the Egyptian firstborn." excuse me, God, that's not what I signed up for. I'm in it for the Sudoku and the tea. I'm not in it for the diseased houses. Like, 
like the striking down of the Egyptian firstborns. Um, how do you make sense of this? What Put it in the chat, or if you want to raise a hand and give me two sentences, how do you make sense of this fact that the, the God is saying, when you come to the land, this really not fun stuff is going to happen. We're going to we're going to echo the striking down of the Egyptian firstborns. And what that echo is going to do is to disease your very houses, the places in which you live. Um, Carlos put in something interesting in the chat saying, well, maybe we're just striking down the first generation. And so that that allows for a second generation. That's interesting. The first generation will actually never come into the land, right? The first generation will have been struck down before we enter the land. Um, but interesting. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. What else? What other thoughts do you have? Why? Why is it when we enter this land, we have paid in misery? Why do we have dirty houses and and uh, plague? Okay. Okay, interesting. Martin says, and Martin, I'm going to read into your words a little bit. So there's something about entering the land. We're coming into these houses. And as we'll see in Deuteronomy, these are houses we didn't build. These are fields we didn't plant, right? We're coming into the land and we are dispossessing the Canaanites. We are kicking the Canaanites out. Um, Yefe, Rabbi Saul. Um, that there's that these houses are other people's houses. And so there's something about we need to either purify them or we're exposing the fact that that they're not ours. There's some sort of ritual maybe going on that transfers ownership, that that purifies something that wasn't mine and turns it into mine. Um Interesting. Okay, so when you come into the land, and it's almost like we have an ellipsis and say, and you have to get rid of all the Canaanites. And once you've gotten rid of all the Canaanites, then you are going to be living in their houses. And that's a little, that's, that's a little, I mean, awkward is putting it lightly. That's, um, that's a little presumptuous. That's that's saying something about living in a house that's not yours. Um, Cool. Okay. Uh, I'm going to push you guys a little bit more on those houses. So as the chapter continues, and we're not going to read all of this, but as the chapter continues, it talks about the way we purify these houses. And it says that we take the houses and we take the dust and we put some of the dust outside or we take the stones and we put the stones outside, um, outside the camp. We like deconstruct the houses. We take, these houses are built of, of dirt. These houses are built of stone. These houses are built of like natural elements. And when we deconstruct them, we are turning those elements of the house back into the land from which they came, right? So um, anybody know the way, like Deuteron Deuteronomy reading of uh, the way we think about our relationship to the land, to the Adama or the Eretz, when we're in Canaan, what what is the land in relationship to us? Do we get along? What happens when we pollute the land? Um, awesome, Rabbi Saul. Conditional. Tell me more. Tell me more. What what's conditional? What is our relationship with this land? I know you, I know. Okay, okay, Ar awesome. Arnold, the land is God's, it's not ours. Richard says, it's, it is filling in Rabbi Saul's conditional, right? If you follow my commandments, then all the good stuff happens in the land. And if not, as Neil says, then the land is going to vomit us out. Um, okay, you fit. So, this is our staying in the land. This when you enter the land, when we get to Deuteronomy, is you will enter the land and you get to stay there only until you screw it up, only until you pollute the land. Um, and then you will get vomited out, then you will get dispossessed from the land. Whoever put a vomit emoji on Neil's comment, you are too funny. Um 
if I, yeah, Noah, so it's it's like the Garden of Eden. It's similar idea, right? And we see that strain running through the whole Tanakh. We get the good thing only until we mess up the good thing and then we get exiled until we get another chance. Um, okay, so with that in mind, with like the land itself, like the literal, you know, dirt and soil and rocks is is holy. Is It's holy and it's something that we can pollute. It's something that our actions can mess up. Uh, talk to me about the fact that these houses are made out of land. We're taking the dirt and the stones and the rocks and we're turning them into houses or we're coming upon them having been built as houses. These, these houses are somehow the transformation of land itself into a human thing. This is humans using human agency to make houses out of land. And the way we purify the houses, the way we get rid of zarat in our houses is by taking out those stones and taking out the dust and bringing it back to the land itself, bringing it outside the camp, outside of human habitation. Um, what do you make about of that? What is the connection between the idea of the house constructed and the land itself? Give me give me answers in the chat because this whole unmuting is too complicated. Um, answers in the chat. Connection between building of houses and the land itself. How do you understand the fact that houses are made of land and we transform them into houses? Ooh, Rabbi Saul, I am loving your comments. This is this is great. Um, Rabbi Saul says nothing is ultimately or ours. So that there's this this idea that the the, the houses themselves are temporary, the houses are constructed and can be deconstructed. It's, I mean, that that idea of dust, right? Like we, Genesis, Genesis, what is it? Genesis three are also made of dust. Okay. Eleanor says the transformation from land to house makes it become unholy. Interesting. I would say it gives it the potential to be unholy. Um, Marcy says, if you purify the house, the, you purify the land. Oh, that's cool. Okay, right? So when you come to the land, like, you're going to come to these houses that aren't yours and they are in some way impure. But by purifying the houses, you are therefore, like, taking possession of the land. The way you turn the land into a ahuza is by purifying the house itself. Cool. Um, Yefe, yefe. Okay. I'm going to complicate yeah, Amy, right? It definitely feels like the Shema. And now, Arnold, you are you are taking the words right out of my mouth. Okay, so we're going to look now. Arnold says, is there a relationship between the homes and the tabernacle? And there might be, because we said at the very beginning that this, like the translation here is chunky and weird, right? The translation of the end of this verse, verse 34, is like, I uh, in the house of the land of y'all's possession. And we say, okay, that, sorry, <laughs> like, don't, don't you know how to write? Why, why, why is this so chunky? Why is this, why is this like, like falling off my tongue? We might expect it to say houses, houses, plural. And instead houses is, or sorry, house is singular, but just, just the one, just the one house. What, why might it just say one house? Why is this one house rather than houses? To what is this house referring? Is this like, are we, I mean, is this just, you know, sloppy writing? And I'm saying house, like each of your houses. Joel says, this is the Beta Mikdash. This is the temple. All right, this is getting that the definitely, definitely a way to read it into the text. Let's fall down Joel's rabbit hole there. If this is the Beta Mikdash, this gets really, really uncomfortable. When we come to the land, God is going to put zarat, going to put disease in the temple. What? Don't 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 do that, God. Like the like the 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 Beit Hamikdash, the temple is your dwelling place. Don't put zarat. Don't put disease in your dwelling place. Don't put it in your temple. And yet, yet there's it's there as a reading. It's there that this 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 disease is going to be put into into the the bite into the the temple um really uncomfortable kind of scary um 
Okay, Neil is is back on this. Well, maybe it's in, in sorry, uh, vaccination. Maybe it's it's well, we're going to put in this disease and then we'll come out stronger on the other side. Let's keep going. Or, uh, before we keep going, any other ideas on what what it would mean if we're reading this as as God's dwelling place is the one that God's giving disease into? Okay, Sherry says it could refer to idols or lack of belief that somehow. How, even even if we're making as Marcy's saying even if we're making God's house like we're we're known for screwing things up like first time around when God was giving Moses instructions on how to make the make his make the 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 uh the tabernacle we were busy building the golden calf okay um just one thing as well on the idea of this is the temple, right? You know, the temple connection between the temple and the land. Um, human agency in the creation of the temple, right? We are not allowed to like make the temple with tools. We can't use hewn stones to make the temple. So that the temple is this almost natural phenomenon that we're just sort of nudging into place. The temple is very close to being land itself. Okay. So, oh, Betsy, that's lovely. Um, so let's, let's keep going with the, the source sheet. If Mara, would you, would you scroll down to the second source, the Pesik de Rabatai? Thank you. All right. So we're going to read a couple of Midrashim, which give us a couple different options. Um, some of which you all have brought and some of which you have not brought. These are not exhaustive. There are so many more ways to read it, so many other ways to understand this. I'm going to read it in the English for the sake of us all understanding. So Pasik Rabbatai is saying, okay, why Zarat? Where does this disease come from? What is the purpose of Zarat? It says... God first begins first with a man's house. So God first gives disease into a man's house. If a man repents, the requirement is no more than that the stones discolored by the infection be taken out. But if a man does not repent, the requirement is the stones and the house itself be broken. Now, so this is automatically assuming that disease is a punishment. The disease is a consequence of us doing something wrong. And more than a punishment, it's a message, right? It's a way of God communicating with us to tell us, okay, you need to do something. You need to repent. And if the message doesn't get through when it's on our houses, then it comes and says, okay, now it's going to, I'm going to continue reading. God begins on the man's garments. Once again, you're given an opportunity to repent. And if you don't, uh, you can tear out the part of the garment. If you still don't repent, then you need to burn your clothes. And now if you still haven't gotten the message, you're, you're, you've lost your house, you've lost your clothes, and you still don't get it, then uh, God begins on your body. And if you repent, then you get cured. But if you do not repent, then you dwell apart. Your dwelling shall be outside of camp. And that that language, that Vedad language echoes lamentations for those of you to whom that means something. So it's this like you start in, in the Pasik de Rabatai, you start with the destruction of the house and you end with a person away from their community, away from their home, not even able to wear their own clothes anymore totally isolated that this is this is happening you are you are othered you're taken out you're made apart um and that is the purpose of zarat zarat is to try and get the message through to you that you need to change your ways if you person don't do that then you are no longer allowed to be part of the community okay um yeah, Arnold says it's an interpretation that pe turns people off to religion. It's like, no, God, could you not find a better way of communicating? Um, all right, all right. So let's let's see if we can find one 
that resonates a little bit more. Gali says we need to investigate what repent means. And yet, Gali, right, there's something odd here that like we don't know for what Sarat comes. Like we don't know what we did wrong, but we need to we need to stop whatever it was and do chuva. You fit. Okay. So then we're gonna go to the Tosefta. Uh the Tosefta says, and I'm just gonna read the first first uh, sentence here, a stricken house, that's a, a house that has this, this uh, disease has never come into existence and is never going to come into existence. So the Tosefta is saying, no, wait a minute. Like, it's fine. Like, this is not something we have to worry about. The idea of a house with disease doesn't exist. This is not an actual thing. That's a pretty, pretty big, bold statement for the Tosefta to be saying about the Bible. What do you guys make of it? Why would the Tosefta want to say that? Why would the Tosefta say, like, this is not a thing? What is the Tosefta pushing back against when the Tosefta says, no such thing. Don't worry about a stricken house. Don't worry about a house with skin disease. This doesn't exist. This will not exist. Um, what are they, what's, what's uncomfortable for them and why are they, why are they pushing back in that way? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe like if someone earlier had said, this sounds like, this sounds like cleaning a, a house for Pesach, right? And maybe it's just like, no, okay, calm down. Like it's okay that if if there's something if there's something scary about the idea of a house with the disease, Arnold's saying, like, it's okay. Stop worrying about this. This isn't a thing. Like you can worry about yourself, you can worry about actual stuff, but you don't need to worry about like the big bad wolf of houses that have that lot. Um, okay, okay. Um JF Campos says, is this is this actually a thing? Have we ever seen a house with with disease? Um, and Andrew says, yeah, well, black mold's a thing. Like if we think of this literally, like, yes, houses can get moldy and it's kind of yuck. Um I okay, you fay. Um and Rabbi Saul says, this is not the only case where we say, okay, this thing we find in the Bible doesn't actually exist. It's it's like it's like a rebellious sun where we're building this big fence abound. Don't worry about this thing that's happening. Um, Yefe. Okay. So uh moving on to the next uh next source. This is uh the Midrash on Leviticus, which many of you were citing Rashi, who cites this Midrash. Um the Midrash says. Why is it written? And I will, I will give, I will give skin disease. I will plague them with skin disease. Well, Rabbi Chia taught it's actually a good thing. And Rabbi Shimon explains when the Canaanites heard that Israel was coming upon them, they arose and concealed their money in the houses and in the fields. And God said. I promised their ancestors that I will take their descendants into a land full of everything is everything good. As proof text, it says in Deuteronomy, house is full of everything good. What does the whole what does God do? He brings the disease into somebody's house, and then the person who now owns the house has to knock the house down and find the hidden gold. So just clarifying what happens here. The Canaanites hear that the Israelites are coming. They hide all their gold in the walls of their houses. And then the Israelites come and dispossess the Canaanites, take their houses. And then God's like, no, there's some gold hidden in the walls and you have to walk, knock the walls down. But God's not actually saying that. Instead, God is making this disease appear on the walls. And when we respond to it by knocking the house down, we find the hidden gold live happily ever after. Um, so this is playing with 
the uncomfortableness that many of you expressed in the fact that we're coming into a land and taking other people's houses. And not only are we taking other people's houses, we're taking the stuff that they hid in the houses to keep safe. Um, and here, this this Midrash says, no, it's a good thing. No, this is God's plan. And like, not only do we get their houses, we also get the hidden gold of their houses. Like, thank God. Okay, so there, there's that. Um, we've got one more source I want to read, and then I want to make sense and see how you guys make sense of this. So the last source is a little more complicated. The last source is playing with the idea of uh, of the, the house singular representing the temple. And it says, okay, what's happening when we're saying the house gets stricken with disease, gets plagued by disease, that's talking about, as many of you saying, have said, that's when we bring idols in, that's when we do something bad. Um, and the point at which that happens is towards the towards hundreds of years later, the destruction of the temple. So we come and uh, do idol worship, do something bad within the temple, and then the temple gets destroyed. Um, what exactly it is, I'm going to read the very bottom of the source. This is the filth of idol worship. This is the idol of Menashe, as is and and then it brings a bunch of different others. Uh, it's source text saying, okay, this is this is what we've done wrong, and this is why the temple is destroyed. So that contained in just this one tiny verse in our parasha, we have, uh, we have God saying, okay, when you come into the land, you can be there for hundreds of years, but eventually you are going to profane. You are going to do something wrong to the temple, which is going to lead to the destruction of the temple itself. Okay, and that's changing the words a tiny bit because God actually says, I will give, like this is coming from God. I will give you the land and then I will give the zalat. I will give the disease into the house. So God is causing not just the giving of the land, God is also causing the giving of the destruction of the temple, right? That at the same point that we enter the land, the destruction of the, the, destruction of the temple and the exile from the land is also there encapsulated in that same idea. All right. So y'all have started saying very, very interesting things um, here. I've gotten, I'm seeing a lot of, a, the strong desire to read this as metaphoric. Um, and I wanna just open, open the door for, for, how you might read that as metaphoric today. If if you're reading this verse here and now today, what does it mean? What do you do with that? When you come to the land, when I come to what land? When I come to Israel, like there's a couple of commandments that are specifically about the land of Israel, including this one. And some of you might live in Israel, but it's Shabbat there. It's almost Shabbat there. Um, I... When you come to the land, then you're going to have this diseased house. Talk to me about how you make meaning of this verse here now today. Um, put it put it in the chat, or, um, or we've got time. So if you want to raise an actual hand, I can I can call on you. How do you make meaning? Oh, Marcy, powerful idea. The land isn't kosher for us. That there's something there's something about like somehow our very presence is going to pollute the land when we come into the land maybe it's us who are bringing the disease with us i mean that works with the flow of the the parasha right we're the ones who've had disease on our skin now we're going to come into the houses and next thing the we know the houses are going to have disease voila okay so there's something about humans that brings impurity are you guys have you um heard of of Jacob Milgram, he's great, great scholar who's written extensively on Leviticus, and his thesis about what impurity is is impurity is death. Impurity is anything that's associated with death. So reading that into Marcy's comment, yeah, 
we are the ones who are bringing impurity to the land because we are the ones who are mortal, right? We are the ones who are bringing the potential to die with us in. Um, we are bringing we are bringing death um, and the the inevitability of death into the land. And therefore, we also need to bring an antidote to that. If God is the God of life and we are we are B'nai Adam, we are mortals, then we have, in order to be in relationship with God, we need to have some sort of purification ritual that that allows us to remove the stink, the stench of death from us. Interesting. Okay. Um, we have, oh, awesome, Ross. So we have... We have this idea that um, when we actually find the story of us entering the land in the in Joshua, um, we actually don't live in other people's houses. We destroy other people's houses. That maybe it's like, no, I was given the option to live in other people's houses and I was going to find all this, this disease in them. No, thank you. I'll destroy and rebuild. Um, Jenny's taking it in a spiritual direction, saying, okay, how do I... How do I live with disease? How do I understand myself as a house of God? Well, maybe it's, maybe it's, it's, I find God within myself and make myself a house for God. And then I don't have to worry about disease. Yefe. Rabbi Saul asks, how can blood used to be, you be used to purify for death, to compensate for death? Because blood often comes from death. That is million dollar question. It is longer than the three minutes I have to answer. Um, but go read Jacob Milgram. Um, and and you look for that answer and the fact that like what is blood in the Tanakh, right? Like blood belongs to God because Nefesh Adam is in the 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 soul of of man is in the blood. The soul of an animal is in its blood. So that blood is both a living substance and a dead substance. Um yife. Okay. Um, other other final thoughts about about why wh how you find meaning from this one verse. What does it mean that when you enter the land, <laughs> God is is gonna gonna bring in disease to the land, disease your houses. That the promise that the 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 solution and the, or the the yeah the the good and the bad come together. That even even as we're promised redemption, we're also promised destruction. Arnold, that's beautiful. Disease is always around. Badness is always around. Keep a strong watch on everyday things. Yeah. Okay. So that like coming into the land is not is not going to solve everything for us. Like, I mean, you come in like I'm, you come into the land post Shoah and it's not the end of the story, right? We get our own land and it's not the end of the story. That coming, it's when you enter the land in some ways, then the problems start. Then you have to figure out how to govern. Then you have to figure out how to deal with the fact that you have houses, that you have responsibilities, that you have to have to figure out how to get rid of black mold, um, that you're fundamentally changing your relationship to God once you are in the land and you have to figure out how to keep God with you even as you enter the land. Tov, we are almost out of time. I want to thank everybody for your comments and for your presence. If you have more to hear them, um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. It's also on the source sheet. Um, and I, I write a weekly Devar Torah, which you're welcome to sign up for. Email me and I'll put you in it. I also teach a weekly Parashat Shavua class, one for rabbis and one for everybody. So if you're interested, email me and I can sign you up. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Bex, for bringing really interesting, thought-provoking Torah this uh, Shabbat before Pesach. Uh, before we close out and we wish you all a Shabbat Shalom, I'm just adding into the chat um, our Seder. Um, we are having an online uh, Seder the second night of Passover, um, and I hope that you take this as a uh, formal invitation uh, to, to join us and to join our community here. Um, as always, Shabbat Shalom to, to you, wishing you a restful Shabbos. 
and uh, we hope to see you here next week. Bye, everyone.